pleasure of introducing Robert Rakel, who's going to be giving our talk tonight. He's the Emeritus Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Baylor College of, of Medicine in Houston, which is now the largest medical center in the world. Prior to joining Baylor, Dr. Rakel was a member of the class of 1958 at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and entered private practice in California in 1962. He became the first chairman of the family practice program at the University of California, Irvine, in 1969. In 1971, he was named head of family medicine at the University of Iowa College of Medicine. He joined Baylor in 1985 as Associate Dean for Academic and Clinical Affairs and Chairman of Family Medicine, a position he held until 1997 when he retired. In 1978, while teaching at the University of Iowa, he established the History of Medicine Society and directed it until 1985. At Baylor, Dr. Rakel again established a History of Medicine Society. He's authored or edited nearly 50 books and held leadership positions at the American Board of Family Practice, JAMA, and the American Medical Student Association. He hosted Family Practice Update on Lifetime Medical Television from 1986 to 1993. He's considered one of the founding fathers of family medicine and has authored a number of texts <coughs> in the field, including Textbook of Family Medicine, 8th edition. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Rachel. designed a tie, and we sold it, and we made a few bucks. And so we had a red one with the stripes, but this is the old tower uh, that we used as our logo. And so we have a red one and a blue one. <laughs> so whatever you want, and we even had uh, bow ties, but they're all gone. But anyway, I thought I'd bring these, because that's really history. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, when I came here, the tower was where you entered the hospital. Uh, now you have a hard time seeing it unless you go to the fifth floor of a certain building, I guess. I'm not sure what it is, but it's a pleasure to be back. I did uh, uh, start the History of Medicine Society here purely for selfish reasons. I enjoyed, uh, well, first of all, in high school, I petitioned the president of the high school for me not to have to take history because I hated history, and I wanted to take science. And I would say, can I replace it with another science? No, you can't. Well, in those days, it was all dates and stuff, uh, as you remember. Uh, but then I became very interested in it and enjoyed uh, hearing uh, people talk about historical features that I wasn't aware of. So I said, why not start a group and I picked the speakers, and I picked topics that I enjoy. So it, was, it was purely selfish. Uh, I've done the same thing in Houston, and it's still going. So uh, it's working. Uh, at least uh, I really enjoy it. And uh, we have a large group down there that are continuing to uh, come to monthly lectures. Uh, we have an elective for medical students, both at UT and at Baylor. Uh, and uh, as Donna said, uh, the Texas Medical Center is the largest medical center in the world. <laughs> and when I arrived there in 1985, uh, they recruited me from here to be head of family medicine, the first head of family medicine down there. And I said, why should I just change schools to have the same title? So they made me associate dean also. 
and I had fun representing the school at different things. But the point is that the uh, medical center, which really is uh, so large, had no history of medicine activity at all. I couldn't believe it. So having enjoyed the time here, uh, started the same thing there, and it's going very well. What allows it to go very well, because we get no, almost no funding support from the medical schools. Baylor gives us nothing, UT gives us nothing, what have you. So it's all donations, so that's my pitch. Uh, what I suggested to Donna is that uh, if you just have one good endowment, it really takes care of uh, most of the needs of a uh, society like this. Uh, or you donate enough, as I plan to, to have a lecture in your name every year. Uh, it'd be nice if I could pick the speaker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let me uh, stop digressing, although I'm going to digress a lot. Uh, and the title is not so much about the start. Oh, I'm going to talk about Bill Bean. I'm going to talk about Oisler, and I'm going to talk about Palmer Howard. Uh, Bill Bean was one of the reasons I came to the University of Iowa. I really had admired his writings, uh, admired him in so many ways, and uh, he was part of the recruiting process that uh, brought me here, uh, which I really enjoyed. Bill and I uh, became good friends. We played tennis regularly. He wasn't uh, very fast or agile, but he was always where I was going to hit the ball. He could anticipate where that ball was going. Uh, and then uh, he uh, moved to Galveston for a while, as you know, headed for the Institute of Humanities down there. And uh, uh, then uh, when he came back here, uh, and in his terminal days, my daughter Barbara, who teaches at the School of Nursing, was his nurse. So we had a lot of connections. But what I was going to say was that Bill was the real support person for the History of Medicine Society. No matter what speaker we had or what topic we had, Bill Bean would have something substantial to add. And it was always really an exciting uh, group that we uh, had, even though it was a small uh, but dynamic group. Well, let's, uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit among the, about those three people. But I want to start, first of all, with this. How many of you have been to see the original painting of the doctor? One. If you ever get to London, go see it. This painting is about three times as large as this screen. It's an enormous painting. And Sir Luke Phyllis, when he painted it, uh, mocked up this whole room in his studio and then had relatives, I think, as uh, the family in the background. And it depicts, and it really is the best picture depicting medicine in a positive light, even though it was before the days of antibiotics <coughs> or any rescue drugs. But it depicts uh, a doctor caring for a very sick child, who I think was a relative of the painter, Sir Luke Phillips, uh, and uh, is now uh, reproduced many times, as you know. But uh, go see the original if you can. And if you go, whenever you see the picture, I want to challenge you for one thing, and I can't find anybody that knows this answer, but we all have guesses. So the doctor is sitting by the bedside, sort of a makeshift bed on two chairs of a child that was very ill. Uh, the light just coming in the window is supposed to represent morning, and that the child lived through the night. And so the doctor, all he had was compassion to sit there and uh, worry about the child. So my question to you is, what is this? There's an item on the floor, there are two pieces, one piece there, one piece here. Now one theory is that there are prescriptions that the doctor knew was useless and he threw them away. The other is, which I think makes more sense, you see the child's hand appear like this, there's the cup or something that dropped out of the child's hand and then broke on the floor. But I don't know if we'll ever go because I've read everything I could about the painting, and no one ever says what those items are, and, and the painters did not leave any clues. So uh, we'll uh, leave it at that. But it's a it's a wonderful painting that I think depicts the compassion of a physician, even though we have no mi uh, miracle drugs to use. Well, this is my friend and faculty member, R. Palmer Hubbard. 
don't know how many of you knew him, but uh, Palmer, good. <laughs> Picture looks pretty good, doesn't it? His daughter Caroline, in the white hair back here, uh, gave me this and a few other pictures, and we'll call on her for a few comments a little later on. Uh, but Palmer retired from the University of Oklahoma, and I was lucky enough to be able to entice him to come here, and he then carried on the History of Medicine Society after I left and moved to Houston for Baylor. Uh, Palmer, uh, while he was here, and I was a strong supporter of any publication, wrote this book called The Chief, called Dr. William, The Chief, colon, Dr. William Osler by R. Palmer Howard. And uh, it really is mostly a story of the Howard family. We're going to go into a little more of that as well. Uh, but he spent a lot of time on that. Now, Palmer was also a member of the American Osler Society. And if you don't know what that is, it's a group of about 100 people, most of them scholars, faculty members, most of them physicians, uh, in the United States and Canada, uh, who meet once a year and talk about Osler, or talk about things Osler would have talked about and admire things that Osler admired. So uh, anything <coughs> connected to Osler, they had me. And uh, Palmer was the president of the American Osler Society one year when it met in Indianapolis. I'm um, sorry, in Minneapolis. And um, enticed me to join. And uh, fortunately, I also became president of the American Osler Society. I was a lot luckier than Palmer, though. He was president when they met in Minneapolis, and I was president the first and only year at that time that we met in London. <laughs> so we met with the London Osler Society. There's also a Japanese Osler Society. Uh, Shigeki Hinohara uh, is a Japanese uh, professor who translated a lot of Osler's works into Japanese, and he still attends, as far as I know, even though he's in his mid-90s now. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was uh, very fortunate to, uh, to be able to be there, and Peggy and I enjoyed touring the area after that. Well, Palmer, and I'm going to, to dwell on this to a degree, uh, it, it's, I'm sorry, let's go back. It's R. Palmer Howard, and everybody called him Palmer, and we knew him as Palmer, and there are others in the family that it was R. Palmer Howard. Palmer was the word uh, that they, the name they really went by. Well, this is the book, this is the front page of The Chief, Dr. William Osler by R. Palmer Howard. Uh, this is one of Osler's uh, best pictures, or famous ones anyway, in 19, uh, 1881. Um, I'll show you more pictures of Osler as we go on here. Now this is in the book, and it's the family tree of the Howard family. And let's go back. Uh, well, let me go forward for just a minute. No, it's not my next slide, okay. Uh, this is R. Palmer Howard, same name. R. Palmer Howard was the Dean of Medicine at McGill University, College of Medicine, uh, in Montreal, where Osler went to uh, as a medical student. And he became, this was his father figure, and Osler, uh, Palmer Howard took Osler under his wing, and uh, there was a very close relationship there. So much so that when R. Palmer Howard had a child, Campbell Howard, he asked Osler to be the godfather. So Osler was godfather to, I'm um, sorry, Campbell Howard's son, uh, Campbell Howard then became godfather to Palmer Howard, who we just saw the picture of, our faculty member here at Iowa. Uh, Palmer Howard also then was made the godson of Osler's only child. Uh, he's not up here, and we'll come back to him. But uh, Revere Osler uh, was the godfather for Palmer Howard. So there's a really close relationship between the Howard family and the Osler family. And uh, it was, it's interesting here how the name uh, is the same R. Palmer Howard and Campbell, uh, those two. But also notice one other thing. 
Campbell Howard here, and I'm sorry that's a little out of focus because I just took a picture, I think, with my iPhone of the uh, graph in the book. Uh, Mary Muriel. Can we read Muriel? Not really. Now, there was a Muriel here. Uh, Campbell's sister was named Muriel, right? That's right. And Campbell's wife was Aubrey, though, That's not right. Muriel. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we get down here to our Homer Howard, who was our faculty member here, and he married a Muriel. So our Palmer Howard and Muriel go back and forth. So uh, was had a very pleasant tea at Caroline's the other day, and uh, her brother Campbell Howard was there. And I said, so so after this union, then came Caroline, Caroline, and Palmer, I and Campbell. And my question to Campbell was, is this name going to keep going? Uh, how many more Campbells? How many more or Palmer Howards are there? Please enlighten us. So, my brother Campbell, named after our grandfather Campbell, um, had his first son is Robert. Robert Palmer Howard, <laughs> named after you know our dad, but also after our great grandfather. Then. They have just recently had their first grandson, who is Campbell. <laughs> they did not use the Palmer. His, this new baby, who's uh, just a year old, has a uh, Taiwanese middle name. So the Palmer part stopped at that particular time. But he certainly is, uh, they continued the Robert Campbell, Robert Campbell tradition. Yeah. If they also have a daughter, they have to marry her name her Muriel. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'll leave that up to them. It's <laughs> really an interesting family tree. Okay, so the Oster and Howard families. Homer Howard, the older, uh, was dean at McGill and mentored at Oster. Oster became a professor at age 26, professor of medicine. He was godfather to Palmer Howard's son, Campbell, who then became chair of internal medicine here at Iowa. Rock shortly, uh, Bob, I'll go back to that. Then Campbell Howard was godfather to Revere Osler, and Revere Osler was godfather to Palmer Howard. So it's really not that confusing because the names all stay the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the chair of medicine here at Iowa. And Campbell Howard uh, was recruited here. And I wanted to read one thing about in those days. It was, uh, this was after Abraham Flexner uh, came to this review of all medical schools and came here to Iowa and uh, wrote uh, about the University of Iowa uh, that, quote, the work in anatomy is admirable. A better equipped department, more enthusiastically conducted, is hardly to be found anywhere in the country. The clinical situation, however, is a different is different over altogether. The executive officer of the department lives in Dubuque and it comes to Iowa City two days a week. The professor of surgery resides in Sioux City. Oh. And this was Back in the early 1900s, how did he get here from Sioux City? The clinical instruction is given at the University Hospital, in which less than 90 beds are available for teaching purposes. The hospitals and the teaching process aspects. Uh, uh, Walter Baring resigned as chair of medicine and the professor, and became professor at Drake University College of Medicine. Can you even imagine somebody leaving this institution to go to be a professor at Drake, which had a medical school at that time? Uh, and his practice was in Des Moines. Campbell Howard was selected to start uh, in September 1910. This is a good part. Osler wrote to the president of McGill University, quote, I had a cable from Campbell Howard last night saying that he had practically accepted the professorship of medicine at the University of Ohio. <laughs> you didn't say Idaho, at least. 
He, like so many others, confused Iowa with Ohio or Idaho. Campbell Howard and Natalie Wright were married in December of 1911 at the bride's home in Ottawa, Canada. She will be a great help with the, uh, uh, with the students and the doctors. Get this one. And she can talk most intelligently about nothing. <laughs> which is a great art. <laughs> a lot of women put us men to shame with that, uh, that comment. Uh, so Campbell then uh, came here as sure as after a period. And this is a, a plaque that was put up uh, about him. Professor at the Department of Internal Medicine, 1910, 1924. Now this plaque used to be outside the alumni auditorium. Uh, yesterday, I wanted to see it. I wanted to see if it was still there. So I walked up to the alumni auditorium, and there was a plaque in there, but it was to Ernie Thiel, who was on the faculty when I was here. Uh, and nowhere could I see this plaque to Campbell Howard. So I walked to the internal medicine offices, the administrative office, and uh, the gal at the front desk right inside the door I said, there used to be a plaque to Campbell Howard uh, around here, uh, but I can't find it. And she said, oh, here it is. And behind her desk, she had three paintings. One large one, I can't remember what it was, uh, and uh, two others. And so she sort of paged the first one forward and held up what was behind it, which was this plaque. <laughs> Caroline, you've got to get somebody to buy that plaque or do something with it. <laughs> I said, how did you happen to have it? Well, they remodeled and they didn't know what to do with it, what have you, and so she just set it there. So I, somehow the history of medicine group ought to resurrect this or at least give it a position of uh, prominence better than where it is at the, person, at the present time. <laughs> well, this is Campbell Howard with Palmer and Uriel. Palmer here, Uriel. Yeah. These pictures uh, courtesy of Caroline. Uh, here's uh, Palmer again and Muriel. Uh, they had stuck in this picture, right? No, no, but that was taken at um, Osler's place in England. Um, it was an Easter egg hunt that uh, Lady Osler was hosting. Good. I'll that. She's talking about Open Arms, the big house that those who lived in in Oxford. I'll have a picture of that in a minute. So this is Osler. This is the, one of the most famous poses of Osler. Uh, this is it in reverse. Now this particular pose of this painting, uh, the Mead Johnson Pharmaceutical Company at one time hired an artist to paint the three or four most famous North American physicians. And obviously, Oster was one of them, and uh, he picked this pose. And this is the painting that he came up with. Uh, and I don't think it's very pretty. I, the blue is uh, sort of grotesque, uh, and it really just doesn't fit. I don't think Oster ever owned a blue suit like that. Uh, but anyway, they had prints made of these four physicians and distributed them to practicing physicians uh, around the country. And uh, then at the end of that, when they were finished with it, uh, I was lucky enough. I was doing some consulting work for them at the time, and they gave me the original. So this picture, this painting, is hanging above my desk at uh, Baylor right now. Uh, and uh, as ugly as it is, I still like it <laughs> and keep it there. Well, this is R. Palmer Howard Sr. <laughs> The, the older one that was the dean at McGill. And it was, uh, first of all, you know, I'll get back to this later. Um, Osler was going into the ministry. He was going to be a, an Anglican minister like his father was. Uh, and he went to Trinity College in Canada to prepare for the ministry. And while he was there, he got dissuaded and turned toward medicine instead of uh, the ministry. And uh, Bill Bean has a similar story, and I'll show you a video later on of Bill saying exactly that same thing. So, uh, our Palmer Howard, now, here he is here. These are the three teachers that Oster 
credits with everything he did. First of all, Osler was a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> he got into all kinds of mischief and trouble. He would spend a night in jail because he tried to fumigate a teacher that said some bad things about a student. <laughs> uh, and so it was these three men that really turned him around. It shows you how many people today that are having a hard time as kids really could turn out to be somebody outstanding uh, if the right person has an influence on them. And so here we had uh, Paul Verhauer, obviously. Uh, we had Reverend Johnson, who was uh, at uh, Trinity. And we had James Bottle. Now, James Bottle was a physician at the time. And I think he was the greatest influence on Osler. In fact, Osler, the rest of his life, even as a Regis professor at Oxford, would doodle during lectures or any meeting or what have you. And his favorite doodle was the name of James Bottle. Uh, and I didn't put that slide in here, but uh, I have a great slide of all of his doodling on one page one time. So these men really turned Osler around uh, and, and got him interested in science. They went on field trips together. And uh, Osler then uh, went to Toronto Medical School, but uh, changed after a year and went to McGill. Uh, it was a better school, had better clinical material, and uh, graduated from McGill. Well, this is where Osler grew up. Anybody here been to Bondhead? Well, we at Peg and I were traveling up through Canada, and I had to make a pilgrimage to Osler's birthplace. So I didn't take this picture. This is an old picture of his house where he lived. But I did take this picture. This is where Osler's house was. Uh, and they have a, a plaque here to Osler, uh, and there are plaques around the city of Bondhead, which is still a very small, sleepy Canadian town uh, that Osler uh, lived there. But what I want you to notice here, and this was almost 100 years after Osler lived there, look at what you see here. It's a cornfield. That cornfield was there when Osler was there. 100 years later, it's still a cornfield. Looks like Iowa. <laughs> uh, so I, I thought that was it. Now, in town, uh, this is his father, Feather Still Mosler, who was sent to uh, Bondhead from uh, England. And then he went from Bondhead to Dundas. And this picture was taken when he was a pastor at Dundas. And this is the church that he was at. And this is an add on with plain cinder block. Uh, you can't see it, but this is the William Osler addition. So they named an addition to the main church after William Osler. This is the open arms. Now Osler went from McGill to the University of Pennsylvania. He went from the University of Pennsylvania to Johns Hopkins and was the very first professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins. Started the department there, but he got there before the school opened. So if you're familiar with his textbook, his textbook was the most famous textbook of medicine in the world. And he wrote it while he was waiting for Johns Hopkins to open. Uh, and, and it was a, a one author. You know, I've edited books, but I get a, other experts to write on the material. He wrote the whole thing uh, in many editions. Well, he then was recruited from Johns Hopkins when he thought he was over the hill. First of all, he thought anybody over 40 was useless. Especially if you're over 60, you're useless. Uh, and he was nearing 60, and he was attracted to uh, Oxford. And so they recruited him to be the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford. And this was his home in Oxford. It was called the Open Arms. It's an enormous house, as you can see. Uh, but it was called the Open Arms because people were inviting themselves or were invited all the time, especially people from the States and from Canada would come. And he would tell his wife, uh, I don't know, at 3 in the afternoon, get ready for 20 people for dinner. Uh, I'm sure they had enough uh, servants to, to take care of it, but uh, it was that kind of a life. Well, the year that I was president of the Rankin Osler Society and we met there, I was able to take a picture on this stairway back here. Uh, going into the study for Osler's study was over here. That proves I was there. 
<laughs> this was in the backyard of that house, just like the egg, Easter egg hunt was. And uh, this is uh, his wife, Grace Revere Osler. Uh, Revere comes from Paul Revere. And this is their son, named Revere, uh, the great, great, great grandson of Paul Revere. Uh, and so we'll come back to him very soon. Okay, this is the Godfather. So we've already mentioned this, but I'm saying it again. William Osler, and he was called Dosi O oh, to so many people in the family, was godfather to Campbell Howard, who came here to Iowa. Campbell Howard was godfather to Osler's son, Revere, and Revere was godfather to Palmer Howard on our faculty here at Iowa. So the godfathers were a big thing in those days. Well, Revere Osler was not interested in medicine nor books, as was his father. And uh, he enlisted in the First World War. Uh, and this is his uniform uh, in the war. And Osler also was a, an officer in the war. And would, uh, I'm not sure what he did for the troops, but he was involved. And uh, Revere tried to get into the ambulance corps. And for some reason, there was too much red tape for him to get into the ambulance corps. So he joined the artillery. Well, he was in a battle uh, with his artillery and uh, was severely injured by a blast. Now, I, if you know, there are two names that are important in United States medicine. One is uh, Cryo, George Cryo, from the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland uh, Clinic. And uh, the other, and why am I blocking on the name of the neurosurgeon that wrote the biography of Osler that won the Pulitzer Prize? Cushing. Cushing. Thank you very much, Dick. I don't know why I couldn't remember Cushing's name. But Cushing and Cryo were both there nearby when uh, he got injured. And they went to see him. In fact, they did some minor surgery on him that couldn't save him. He died six hours after the surgery. Uh, but to have those two famous surgeons friends of Osler, so close to Revere when he was injured, uh, it was really amazing. Uh, but they still uh, could not save him. So this is a note that Revere sent to Palmer Howard, our faculty member here at Iowa, uh, to Robert Palmer Howard from his godfather, E. Revere Osler, 1912. Well, this is another, has another Iowa connection. This is Osler at his desk. Now, what you need to notice on the desk is this area here and this area here, because then you'll recognize it. Because this desk is in our library in the rare book room uh, here at Iowa. Uh, here's the desk when it was at uh, Homer Howard's home. <laughs> I have a picture of him sitting there, and I have a picture of me sitting there. Uh, the picture of him sitting there is a lot better than mine, so I didn't uh, <laughs> put mine in there, but I did put a better one in there, Caroline. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is uh, as the desk. Now, if we go back, we can probably see what I was talking about before, and you can tell in here that it is the same desk that Oster was uh, sitting at. Now, uh, this is in the rare book room. It's, uh, it's how many years have been there now? Been at least 30 years or um, oh, more than that, 35 years. Probably uh, it was gift, Dad gave it to the library in about 1988. 88, okay. Well, it's showing the wear and tear. We need to get it refinished. It's, uh, it's starting to, to show it a bit, but it's great to have it there. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to read anything of Osler's, now you can read Cushing's biography, which won the Pulitzer Prize, but it's, it's relatively dull, but it's very well written. <laughs> but of all the things Osler wrote, I think this is the best. So if you ever get anything from a rare book room, uh, get his way of life. It was a lecture given to Yale students. He came back his last trip to the States from England and uh, delivered this uh, at Yale in 1913. And in the front of this book, which he specified, if it's ever, uh, when it's published, put this poem there. Now, this poem is from the Sanskrit. 
And it turns out, not surprisingly, to be my favorite poem. Uh, and we have it hanging at home. Salutation of the dawn. Listen to the exhortation of the dawn. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the varieties and the realities of your existence. The bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day, such is the salutation of the dawn. And that was Oster's philosophy. His philosophy is, do what's in front of you and do it as well as you can, and try to ignore extraneous stimuli uh, and focus on what you're, what you're doing. But well, now I'm going to show you some videos of Bill Bean. And uh, most of you knew Bill. And he was a, a great talent, had a great sense of humor. And let's see if I can get this. Some people are so ambitious that they knock people down to get where they want to go. 
<laughs> what was the problem? I loved his grin. It was always that impish grin. Now this is a more professional interview. I'm trying to avoid the Jack Horner complex. He said, what a great boy am I. And I, I think one needs to be uh, keep a, a degree of reasonable humility. And I think if one can laugh heartily at, at oneself, you're not in much danger of going in the other direction too far or staying there too long. I don't say that I have made mistakes in silly ones, but I guess it's fair to say that they never traveled my spirit because they were done with good intentions and they just weren't done as an attack on somebody. And it was maybe because I was just damn stupid about something that I wrote about. But it was wonderful. What a, a, a magical thing memory is that you obviously that many things that I've done that were not good. I've forgotten them. I don't care that the dead with me. That's why I still smile. You gotta still smile. How many hours a week did you write? Of all the other books, all the articles, all the book reviews. Well, most of the ones that were any good had at least five drafts. I'm sorry. I wanted to pause that for a minute because he said five drafts. Now, those of you that have written an article or written a chapter or anything, a good friend of mine in Houston was Jan de Hartog. Now, you may not know the name, but he was a famous author uh, and wrote a number of good plays and movies. He was Dutch, and he'd written movies and starred in them even in Holland, and then moved to the U.S. and in a second language. English, he wrote 35 more books. Just an outstanding person. Uh, the play he wrote that you may be familiar with is The Four Poster, which is a couple going through marriage and it's all in one room with the four poster bed there and all the trials and tribulations they go through. But Jan was a, a great writer. Uh, and I asked him one time, how many drafts does he have to go through to get the finished product? And his answer? Five. Now, I rarely will go that far. Uh, three, maybe, but uh, I rarely go to five. But I, it's interesting that two people now that I admire, Bill Bean and Yonder Hartog, both said five. It's not enough to write so that you may be understood. You must write so that you cannot be misunderstood. I thought I'd put Jim Allen in there. <laughs> appropriate for this audience. Bill Bean once described himself as a grasshopper with epilepsy doing a cha-cha on the runway of a busy airport. <laughs> now, I love that. I love that one. Uh, That's my last uh, video of Bill, and it's short. So, there we are. Life is a long headache in a noisy street. Love the grin. <laughs> so this is the quote of Osler's. I'll let you read it. And I just have a number of my favorite quotes here. Uh, I'm just going to go through them. Osler said this because the press was really tough on him. Uh, and part of the reason was that he played tricks on him. Uh, one time he had a visiting professor come uh, and he was a a uh, very short, hunched over uh, man, and he showed the reporter a picture of John L. Sullivan. Uh, and they printed it as the picture of this famous uh, doctor who was coming to lecture. Uh, and uh, they went after him after that. In fact, they coined the term to osterize, meaning to put somebody to death by ether, uh, because Oster had said, anybody over 65, you might as well put them out of their misery with ether. And, uh, be done with it. Uh, Osler uh, had this one, which I thought was very good. This was my, uh, Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> I was watching Mike and Molly one night, and she said this. So every medical student should be told this. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> And Osler uh, also was uh, not too much for speech.
speaking, but I think it may be this one. Oh, uh, yeah. But this plus the next one uh, are appropriate for this audience. That's why this is a good time to stop. Show that slide. This is my favorite quote. It is better to remain quiet and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all of that. <laughs> Memorize that one. Okay, now you're here because I bribed you. <laughs> now, I'm not above that. Uh, and I'm going to show you a video now of uh, Bob Greenspan. This is uh, the book that you will all get. And this is the picture of the cover. And what I want you to look at is uh, Bob's name. Now, the publisher doesn't show here, but there are so many books like this that are history of medicine with a bunch of pictures that he couldn't find a publisher. So he published it himself. And uh, uh, he's a nephrologist in uh, Washington, D.C. area. And uh, obviously, it cost him a lot of money, but he could afford it, and he published it himself. It is the best history of medicine book that I have ever seen. I say that, and I've seen a lot of them. I say that because he's not a historian. He's a nephrologist. And he tells stories in the book. And what I will uh, have for each of you, if you would like it, what I do when I read a book is I have a highlight pen in my hand. And I highlight things that I think are interesting. Uh, and then what I do afterwards is type them up. And so this is 18 pages of what I think were the most interesting things in this book. So you can just read this. <laughs> uh, but the book is a good coffee table book. And I, let me read you just a few things that I think uh, are interesting in the book, and then we'll see what Bob, uh, uh, what he has a very short video introduction that was made for the medical students. I purchased the books with an account that we had some money in uh, and gave one to each of the students taking our elective. Now, I don't know if you have elective credits here at the school or not, but we have elective credits. You could have up to 20 elective credits qualify you for graduation at Baylor. So we had 25 students taking this course for elective credit. And I gave each one of them one of these books. Now, Bob is working on a second edition, but it won't be possible to do it until he retires, which is in a few years yet. Uh, but he obviously had more printed than he could sell because he didn't have a publisher advertising it for him. Uh, he was the advertisement, and so he ended up with a lot of them, I think, in the warehouse. And so uh, he sold it to me cheap. <laughs> I won't tell you how cheap. Uh, it sells on the market for 125 so get that figure in your head. But anyway, uh, we have one for uh, each of you, since I don't think there are more than 25 here. Uh, but I want to show you the video. But let me just give you an idea of some of the stuff in the book. Uh, and uh, here are just a few that I think are good. Uh, a prominent surgeon in the 19th century was Robert Liston. Uh, and he was proud of his reputation as a fast surgeon, an attribute that was well respected in this pre-anesthetic era. After amputating a limb with one great cut, he would hold the knife in his teeth while suturing the limb, the whole process taking only a few minutes. On one occasion, while he was trying to break his speed record, for a leg amputation. He accidentally amputated both of his patient's testicles. <laughs> and on another, he cut off his assistant's fig fingers, and the poor fellow died of gangrene. The mortality in that procedure rose to three, since not only did the patient die and Liston's assistant die, but so did a surgical colleague who died of fright after Liston had ripped through the poor man's coattails while he was observing the operation. <laughs> so that's the kind of story you don't get back in regular history. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another one here. Uroscopy, which is what that is, uh, uh, called water casting, was taught as early as the second century by Galen 
and remain an important part of medical diagnosis for the next 1,500 years. You know, it, he's got a whole section on quackery, which is really good too, and how people were fooled by uh, stuff that was nothing more than a battery and a light. Predicting what, uh, when the end is near, John Moorfield wrote, if the right eye, oh, this was back in the 1300s, if the right eye of a sick man sheds tears, he will die. In the case of a woman, this applies to the left eye. The sole of a patient's right foot should be anointed with lard, which lard is then thrown to any given dog. If the dog eats it without vomiting, the patient will live. If the dog returns it or makes no attempt to eat it, the patient will die. Another one. Uh, <coughs> this, and this I've heard it a number of times before, but it's really an interesting story, and I'm not going to read it here. But essentially, uh, the use of forceps in deliveries was used since the year 1000, uh, way back when. And in the 17th century, the Chamberlains uh, were a family of barber surgeons that uh, invented the modern obstetric forceps. However, Chamberlain kept this life-saving discovery a family secret, thus transforming this into a story of power, fame, and greed. He performed his deliveries under a sheet, ringing a bell when the procedure was done and kept his discovery within the family where it stayed for generations. When finally sold to a Dutch obstetrician, rather than completely give away the family secret, they sold him only one of the two plates. <laughs> anyway, uh, there's, a, there's another one here about uh, President uh, Garfield. Find that one, because that. President James Garfield, assassinated in 1881 by a disarmed lawyer. Garfield was the last president to be born in a log cabin. He attended Williams College, then was professor of Greek and Latin, and assumed the presidency of the college at the, of age 26 when Osler was a professor. Without a way of determining the bullet's location, every effort was made to remove it. Sixteen doctors probed the wound, all with unwashed hands and instruments. The original wound of three and a half inches became a pus-draining wound of 20 inches. Alexander Graham Bell and Simon Newcomb developed an instrument that would produce a hum when passed over a piece of metal. So they figured, well, this is the way we can find the bullet. They used it on Garfield. But a hum occurred everywhere over the body. The metal detector was thought a failure. However, Garfield was lying on a metal coil spring mattress. Oh. If he'd been moved to another bed, the bullet may have been found easily, because it was in an easy to access uh, place, and his life would have been saved. Well, anyway, those are the kinds of stories that are in the book. And uh, I'll just show you the video of uh, Bob Greenspan, uh, he's talking to medical students at Baylor. Let me first welcome you to the course on the history of medicine, and I would like to thank Dr. Rachel for allowing me to participate. My name is Bob Greenspan. I'm a nephrologist. I practice in Northern Virginia and have, have been doing so for the last 35 years. I've always been interested in the history of medicine, but I've been a little disappointed in that most history books uh, just speak about names and dates, and I'm more interested in the personal history of medicine, how it affected patients, how it affected doctors, nurses, and others. So the book you will receive attempts to uh, put together art, instruments, and history in a very personal way, uh, rather than just names and dates. I got interested in the history of medicine by reading a quote uh, by Johann Diffenbach, who was a an early, 18th century, early 19th century physician uh, who wrote about the vesicular vaginal fistula. After reading that the description, I knew what it was about, where I had not known in the past. If you look at the book on page 258, you will see that description uh, in full, and uh, it should tell you what the disease is about, and that's the aim of the book, and that's the aim of this course, is really not to teach you names and dates, but to give you some feeling of what medical history was about. I hope to 
introduce you to a lot of great physicians, the foremost of which, uh, Sir William Osler, uh, who had, was a famous physician, Canadian, born and then uh, helped establish Johns Hopkins University and then moved on to Oxford University. Uh, some of the quotes you will see uh, are extremely important from a historical standpoint and from a practice standpoint. As a way of introducing the course, I'd like to read several quotes from Dr. Osler. First, regarding training of physicians. The student begins with the patient, continues with the patient, and ends his studies with the patient, using books and lectures as tools as a means to an end. Uh, another quote by Dr. Osler, this regarding patient care. The practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business. A calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. The good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient. And lastly, regarding your career, uh, future career in medicine, the, the hardest conviction to get into the mind of the beginner is that the education upon which he is engaged is not a college course, but a life course, for which the work of a few years under teachers <coughs> is but a preparation. Again, uh, thank you, Dr. Rankle, for allowing me to participate. Hope you enjoy the course. And again, as you finish the course, hopefully you will be better historians, but more importantly, better physicians to your patients. Thank you. Now, if you notice behind him, there were some uh, number of instruments in uh, cabinets. Uh, Bob has a museum uh, there in uh, Virginia that, it, and he collects instruments, medical instruments, and it's really extensive. So he uses, takes a lot of those pictures in the book. But the book is full of a lot of other pictures. Uh, they're not, but you'll see a number of instruments uh, listed in there, and those all uh, are his. And he invites anyone to come by there and see them if you're in the area. It is exactly 6.30, one hour. I didn't think I'd hit it on the nose like that, but thank you all for being here. And if those of you that have a number less than, 140, less than 45, pick up a book on your way out. Thanks for coming.